Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest in our Values Jam guest session series. And Michelle, brilliant to have you here. We were just saying we haven't spoken to each other for quite some time, so it's great to see you. And why don't you introduce yourself to start with? Absolutely. Well, I'm delighted to be involved in the month of July because I live on one of the most isolated islands in the world, but it's hugely influential for its 20 square miles. So reading your July fanzine, um, I was just looking at 4th of July was Independence Day. 18th of July was uh, Nelson Mandela's International Day for Freedom and Democracy. And the 30th of July is International Day of Friendship. So I thought, with your reference to the July 2nd, 1776, uh, America um, was the birth of American independence. I would share how my little tiny 20 square mile island of um, not very many thousands of people contributed uh, through some artful redistribution of materials in 1775. So on August the 14th, a hundred kegs of gunpowder from the British arsenal at St. George um, happened to be moved, rolled down the hill <laughs> uh, to Tobacco Bay in Bermuda and rode out to two American ships. And uh, it went with an invoice, um, you know, Little Island had to feed itself to the Pens Pennsylvania Committee of Safety uh, for... Uh, 1,182 pounds of gunpowder in the amount of 161 pounds uh, in money. So, um, yeah, so in return for the gunpowder, this is what Bermuda got, the absence of a warship through 1778 to allow the locals and their American friends to still bring in provisions because being such an isolated island, we were right in the middle of the British and the Americans war. So, you know, being able to um, furnish supplies to keep people alive was pretty important. And being a British um, base, the British were certainly bringing supplies in, but they were for only the base. So a little interesting area where friendship, international business, um, the brotherhood of organizations uh, coming together through the Freemasons um, allowed the island to survive and um, the Americans to keep their warships out of our borders so we could we could still transport in and out necessities. Well, you know, and this is typical of you, Michelle, because, you know, what you're thinking about here is what might be interesting to people and you're thinking about Bermuda. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Come on. Well, I, I would have to respond starting with a quote by Tasneen Hamid, learn character from trees, values from roots and change from leaves. So for me, being a tree hugger, as you may have realized, uh, my I'm deeply rooted in values that support, support and sustain everything in my life, particularly with the changes that are being demanded of us in these very challenging, complex times. So my work, even though I've been in the business of this my whole career, I now understand more deeply as a speaker who likes to write that I am very much um, like drawn like a magnet to, to being a climate conscious regenerative entrepreneur. So basically I'm in the relationship of alliances for green global transformation, which works well being on an island in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and I'm also an intergenerational collaborator. And that's thanks to being a grandmother, quite frankly, because I know collaboration is not a value, but however, it drives me as a values led leader and a community creator. So as I'm working on my conscious journey and legacy uh, in such a decisive decade around um, the need to protect our planet and near earth orbit, I like to purposefully leave footprints in the digital sands of time. So talking with people like yourself is very important to me. So professionally, I'm uh, a co-chair and uh, founder for an organization called OW2, which is a global action brand um, that is 
about inspiring the next generation's connection to the living world. So moving from fear-based to fun-based, engaging Gen Z, which is the fifth generation in the workforce currently, and making up over 32 to 34% of the world's population. And we're talking a very diverse population. Uh, and busting those myth perceptions and trends. So making it possible for them to envisage a future, get engaged in sustainability and moving away from being overwhelmed um, with the state of the world and moving into make, taking one small action around, around uh, or contributing to sustainability. So basically, you know, Anne Rand, one of my favorite authors, once said, happiness is, a st is the state of consciousness which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. So again, leading by example, living a legacy and creating those digital footprints, which you so wisely do as well, my friend. <laughs> so thanks, Michelle. And I love that leave footprints in the digital sands of time that's just got a lovely ring about it and where can people get hold of you Michelle? LinkedIn is the best place um, under my name so don't put a full stop after the T in my name um, yeah love to love to connect with people and hear what they're doing and how, how we can collaborate because all around the world there are amazing projects going on and with my um, startup I'm involved in it is a global action brand startup so we're all about how to make this possible while staying issue agnostic. So if you want to focus on a certain area of sustainability or protecting the planet, then we're all about making that visible and possible, but from a fun perspective, as opposed to driving more echo anxiety. Great. Okay. So let's get into Values Jam. I've got uh, the deck here and I'm going to tip out some cards. And I'd like you to tell me how many piles you'd like me to make in front of me, please. Oh, let's make seven for the month of July. <laughs> oh, very good. So we're going. And now a number between one and seven. We'll go with one. We'll go with one. OK, so just two cards here. So would you like number one or number two? Number one. This is what we've got. Oh, wonderful. Inclusiveness. <laughs> so let's uh, start with the first question. Uh, what does belonging mean? And what does it look, feel and sound like? Belonging for me is filling that empty seat at the sustainability table. That's you and me and eight billion. Uh, the majority of, of the world's population, human population, does not have a seat at the table. So belonging is actually having a seat and the opportunity to contribute. Uh, full transparency here, I am very much into the democracy of all living beings, and, and that includes non-human living beings. So I'm quite excited to see a trend of adding nature to the board and removing the humans who become a proxy for nature. So that would be my example of belonging and, and where I'm seeing a new trend in the world. Hmm. And you know, when, when I drew the card and asked the question, I started to think from a, an emotional attachment place. So when I think of the word belonging, it means to me that you strongly feel that you're connected. And then when you were talking about the planet, I started to think, actually, there isn't a strong connection between many people and the, their planet, our planet, the planet. And so there doesn't seem to be much of a sense of belonging for us as global citizens, as part of this ecosystem in which we exist. Hmm. What about the what about the metaphor element of the question? Uh, what does it what does belonging look like? What images come to mind? What does it feel like? And what does it sound like? Every breath. One breath comes from the ocean. 
which generates oxygen, and one breath comes from the land. So although we may, as humans, may not always ha have a sense of belonging, because I think there are times when you feel disconnected or unworthy, in actual fact, we are so interconnected as part of the belonging, it's often beyond our realm of understanding. So the one breath comes from the land, one breath comes from the ocean. You, you, you never in your lifetime, every breath means you're connected and you belong. Well, I'm belonging. I, I don't know why this image is in my mind, but an umbilical cord is in my mind. And yes, it's cut physically, but that connection often doesn't go away at all. But I'm kind of still thinking about this uh, relationship between us and the planet. And I'm wondering why there isn't that sense of belonging for many people. Do you, and that what's coming through is kind of taking for granted. And I just want to hear from you what your thoughts are on whether and why we take our beautiful planet for granted so much? I, I would transform for granted to deconditioning. Okay. Deconditioning the growth, the competition, the cannibalism of capitalism. We're, we're, we're conditioned uh, to believe we need to act in a certain way, which is contrary uh, I like to point back to Stone Age economics, the way the way the Corporate Captains Act would actually have kept them out of uh, Stone Age tribes, not leading them. <laughs> uh, so I think the, um, the deconditioning often comes at a certain age uh, when you're when you move from the human doing of the workforce to the human being of prior to the workforce sometimes prior to high school these days, um, and post, uh, post the 80 hour weeks, people are not so, they're able to find their humanness again, their connection to nature, their planet, uh, to, to, their, to their community, their children, their families. Mm. And there's, there's uh, I don't know whether you follow the news in the UK at all, but there's quite a lot of um, discussion around the antics of the stop oil campaign, for for instance, at the minute. And the reason this has kind of come to the surface is because it's the summer and it's the season of sport, and they've targeted a number of sports events um, to disrupt them, to draw attention to their cause. And you could argue that these people have a greater sense of belonging than Joe Public, and that's why they're doing this. But it's actually caused quite a, a fracture because some people are saying, um, well, they're only trying to save the planet. So, you know, you, why should we criticize them? And then other people are saying, actually, uh, through their behavior, they're turning people against the cause that they stand for. Um, so, what's your take on that? Well, I've come back to an earlier comment I made around echo anxiety. If, if you're anxious, you move out of your executive thinking, the front brain, and you move into the old brain. And the old brain is about survival and threat. And every oil company is looking like a saber-toothed tiger to you. Um, so desperate times, desperate measures, uh, anxious people are not always doing the smartest things, but sometimes it takes, like it did with Nelson Mandela, the the, the you had to frankly put your take the take the their foot off your neck so you could speak. Um, uh, I can remember the automakers back in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, the oil companies. Uh, there there's been a huge amount of technological and science scientific advantages um, that we could be doing things a lot different, but preserving the interests of a few are compromising uh, all living beings. Um, 
that's not to say we still shouldn't be vigilant about the things that are coming forward because I don't think there are any easy solutions, but I don't, I don't believe um, the power can remain in the hands of a few affecting all living beings at this point. How they go about that, um, you know, I'm in league with Mahatma Gandhi and the Dalai Lama and the nonviolent approach, um, but I certainly cannot be godlike and say what is wrong, what is right. Uh, but definitely from looking from a neurological perspective, um, there is a huge amount of anxiety echo anxiety out there people are very frightened the news is full of more frightening um more frightening information about the earth heating up and what's happening and the lack of action is very concerning um, and the adjustment of lifestyles and the ability to listen and willing to act uh, i think people are still a little bit in ostrich town with their head in the ground yeah, and I'm bringing it back to belonging. I think one of the indicators of the degree to which you have a feeling or a sense of belonging is the amount of sacrifice or action that you're willing to take because of that association. So if you think about family members, you know, there's a, a strong sense of belonging for many families, not all, but many families. And so, you know, it's not unusual to hear somebody say, I would give my life for my child, for instance. That's about a sense of belonging, I think, as much as anything else. And so thinking about um, these people and the, their disruptive behaviour, rather than criticise them so freely, it might be more interesting to consider, well, if, if they have such a strong conviction, what's, what's driving that? You know, because it, it it might not be that that's their natural way of behaving, but because they believe in the cause so strongly, that's what they're willing to do. And that display of commitment and belonging, um, irrespective of the cause, I think is a powerful demonstration. The exactly. Yeah, Sorry. and I'm doing some um, doing a course with the UNEP, uh, one of their online courses at the moment, and the, which I know as well. They're saying if you engage community and especially the women, you get change. Um, I don't think that oil companies are 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 evidencing a full spectrum of the community or engaged in the community or even have to bother being engaged with the community. But if we really want change and if we have values led leadership, then engaging in the community and finding out how, you know, um, the community can thrive rather than be suffering uh, would be a smart way forward. I mean, how much is enough, Alan? I mean, profit at any price, I mean, money will not help us breathe at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, I saw something uh, recently, which is, it's chilling. And it, it makes me confused and angry. So it was a, a guy basically saying that the last decade has seen the greatest redistribution of wealth in the UK in its history from poor people to rich people yeah. and you know why we we call it a developed country the uk and yet you've got people who are having to make choices between food and warmth in the winter and oil companies and paying out shares um dividends to shareholders and making obscene profit and it's like how how developed is that? <laughs> yeah, this is true. And uh, just to add another statistic, although a bit stated, um, dated an American statistic is the bag lady syndrome um, exists until until there's 11 million, 11 million in the bank. So people have this distorted view of how much is enough. But when you look at the satisfaction research, 
uh, anyone making over 70 to 80,000, when they make more than that, their life quality of life goes down. I think it's between 70 and 90,000. So, you know, when you start looking at, but a lot of people don't have the time or the bandwidth to be considering these things. Yeah. I mean, I personally choose to live very humbly and um, have made huge investments of time, treasure and talent in the world. Uh, but there is no social safety net where I am. So if I was to have a health event or, uh, you know, I, I kind of have just in the last post pandemic gone, oh, heck, you know, maybe I would have been smarter to have created a biggest, bigger nest egg, <laughs> um, which I have chosen not to do. But, um, you know, and I can continue to walk in faith at the moment. But if there was to be a critical factor, uh, I will definitely be on the wrong side of, of safety. Yeah. So I can understand just with, you know, women feeling safe with 8 billion in the bank with, you know, 70 to 90,000 per annum is enough. Your quality of life will fall off. Um, I can understand those types of things. Although I haven't lived my life by material, um, drivers i have to confess being a uh, an older professional i'm now going well you may have been a bit smarter about few, putting your focus on a few other things um uh and i may well reap the rewards or non-rewards from that uh but you know um people are not necessarily thinking that way and understandably um but you know there's a huge need for people who can gift the world but there's a much needed in, in the first world to start rebalancing the spread of wealth. Uh, and that would also contribute to people feeling like they belong. Not so much as char charity, but more so for a fact that they've got, a, they've got access to education, access to healthcare, access to work and dignity. A lot of the um, sustainable development goals just those 17 goals, just focusing on them and being fair and just. But in contrast, um, you know, in North America, it's about the freedom to make as much as you want. There's no freedom. There's no fairness on the block there. You know, <laughs> independence and all the things that uh, um, American and American-led global companies, it's about the freedom to make as much money as you want, which is for a few. It's not, not about the many. Um, yeah, I struggle with that quite a bit, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. There's um, in the business world, there's a quote by uh, Todd Whitaker and Steve Grunert. Uh, they wrote a book and uh, a famous quote from that book is that the culture of an organization is shaped by the worst behavior accepted by leadership. Yes, yes, and exactly. And to your point about society, I've kind of tweaked that. And uh, it's something like um, society is shaped by the way that leaders allow the most vulnerable to live. And yes. we should be judged and held accountable for that, I think, um, because that's the, the real test, how, how you're willing to allow the most vulnerable people to exist. Um, certainly here we're not doing it very well. But I don't, I, don't us, I don't want us to get too despondent. So let's move on. And let, we've talked quite big picture so far. So let's um, bring this right down to a more practical nature. Um, when have you experienced belonging? Oh my goodness, when I'm in nature. I am most at home when I'm going for a swim in the morning down and uh, by the ocean and while I'm in the water watching the long tails feeding their babies in their nest and, you know, heading home and listening to the red birds and the bluebirds sing. And we have whistling frogs here. So my life on the island is actually very much um, immersed in music by nature. Wow. So. I am most happy. Yeah, if it had been raining, you would have heard the frogs, which would have been really tough for your recording, as I know. <laughs> um, from podcasting, it's like, okay, this is a frog day. <laughs> um, but yes, my, 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 um, yeah, my deepest sense of belonging is definitely in nature. 
Mm, so I wasn't going to go there, but you've made me think. I'll give you an example shortly. But my, to be fair to the process, my first thought was actually um, a work setting. So I was the member of um, a team that was responsible for conference and events at the London Intercontinental Hotel in London. Uh, it's just at the bottom of Park Lane. And we, I was, how long was I there for? Uh, two different stints. So I came back to head up the department, but the, the time I'm thinking about was the first stint. And so uh, we just had the most stable team. We had just compliments upon compliment about the way that we did our work. Uh, we liaised with all of the other departments in the hotel to make sure that things were done really well. And it was just a, just a joy. Everything was like clockwork. It didn't, it seemed as though, or oh, I nearly said it didn't seem as though it took any effort. Uh, it did take effort, but it was easy effort, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and there was just this sense of, you were really, really just all together and part of it. And I remember a guy called Pasquale. So he headed up the small team of guys that set the rooms up with the furniture. And they were gold dust because um, to, to increase revenue, we would sell the main ballroom during the day for a conference for like 250 people. And then we would sell it in the evening for a dinner and dance for like 600 people. So uh, the practicalities of that meant that uh, you had a divided room during the day with the conference in one part and then people busy but quiet setting up the tables for the evening in the other half. And then at half past five, you had like two hours to get the evening room set up. And it felt pressured, yes, but not in a bad way because we trusted each other. Everybody chipped in because everybody was needed. And then the organiser, sometimes they were a bit nervous, but you know, you what, what happened in the end was they were like, how did you do that? That was amazing. I never believed it was going to happen. Um, and so that that sense of team and belonging and being part of something great was what popped into my mind first. Then you mentioned nature. And uh, I went to uh, the south of Spain a couple of years ago, and we stayed in a place not too far from Frigoliana, which is near a place called Neja. Uh, so not too far from the coast near Malaga-ish. And it was a previously abandoned village which a couple of brothers were trying to get up and running again. And I asked, uh, where could we go for a walk? And he pointed to this kind of rough track. And he said, well, if you walk that way for about an hour, uh, you'll, you'll hear the water and then you'll come to a river uh, and then come back. <laughs> so we set off and there were hardly any houses. The bird song that you mentioned, the wind, uh, it was a lovely day. And we did hear the water, but didn't find it for another 20 minutes. But that beautiful sound of the water as well. And I, and the reason I brought you, what you said brought it to mind was I remember on that walk, just feeling like this is where I belong. Yeah. Not that specifically, but in this sort of setting, right? So thank you for that memory. That's great that you brought that one back. So let's... Yeah. Let's go to the other side of the coin. Where have you noticed a lack of belonging? Well, interestingly enough, it's become quite visible post-pandemic. Um, being an older professional woman, the invisibility and the opportunities to myth bust or bust myth perceptions, um, I have found that a bit of a struggle. You know, uh, you kind of feel like you're in the 21st century and you know, uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion is all hot off everyone's lips. And yeah, then you strike ageism. And I've, I've actually been a bit frustrated with that. People seeing through me, um, not hearing me. 
that so that has been um a very unsettling experience of not belonging uh that yeah um but typically I find because I love conversation that once the conversation gets going at a table or in a small group the blinders fall away and it becomes very engaging but to be quite frank it's a lot of work to get to that point that I have to confess I have times when I'm like is it really worth it? And that is not my natural inclination. That is the added burden of, um, uh, yeah, of of the un unevolved. <laughs> and you're saying, I, and you're saying think, age, right? Pardon me. Are you you're saying that that's because of age? I think it's age discrimination. Being an older person, um, I tend to cover because I'm an intergenerational person. I am often invited to youth networking groups. Um, I talk all over the place as a speaker. Uh, yeah, so often um, you can be judged by how you look before you open your mouth, uh, and uh, yeah, that's been a new one to to address. And I'm not sure I always have the energy for it. So I look for opportunities for where I can contribute. And I'm a little more discerning about who I'll expose myself to. Um, but it's not my natural inclination. I, but I just have to respect my energies and uh, how much of an uplift do I, do I really want to be bringing. Um, yeah, that, that's been quite challenging. Um, and I, and I, would be grateful for more energy to address it, but that is my barometer is not full enough for lots of addressing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really, uh, so what I've done is to pivot to engage with, um, with people who are more like hearted. So I have this wonderful um, circle of, of very engaged um, youth ambassadors with OW2 and that is definitely filling my cup okay and that, you've reminded me of uh, a few weeks ago I had a values jam with a class of teenagers in Kenya and I'm just why am I thinking of this I'm thinking of this because the way the discussion was framed was not that it was with this old guy, Alan, from the UK that you've got no nothing in common with. It was more framed, uh, we're going to have a values jam and we're just going to choose a card at random and then we're going to have a conversation and Alan's going to lead it. So I just wonder whether for you, whether that's something that might help actually, because what it would do is focus on the conversation rather than focus on you, the person. Um, so that that just popped into my mind. Um, but my, and you reminded me of my uh, uh, experience of not feeling a sense of belonging. I recently did some diversity and inclusion um, training or development with a leadership team who had a real issue uh, in their organization. And so one of the exercises that we did was to ask the question, uh, when have you felt excluded? And to lead, you know, obviously that's when you're with strangers, uh, maybe people wouldn't be so keen to, to share. Uh, so we went first to give an example. And mine was when uh, I went to, uh, so in the UK, you go to primary school and then you go to secondary school. Um, now, I was the only boy on my street to pass the 11 plus exam to get to a grammar school. And we weren't from a, a very privileged background. And on my my first day at school, uh, I was the only boy to turn up wearing shorts because my mum had thought that that was what I should do. And of course, that was not a good start. Um, but I remember um, when, when I progressed through the school, and it was okay because I did all right at sport and I did okay academically, but I remember conversations in what was the sixth form. Um, so this is when you're like 17 years old. And other, my, my peer group 
uh, talking about things like skiing holidays and using words that I just didn't understand what they were. You know, it was like a vocabulary that was completely foreign. And then I remember also them talking about um, going to festival, music festivals during the summer. Uh, and I, I'd never been outside our city, you know, other than on a bus trip or something like that. And so I distinctly remember thinking, I don't fit here. This, these guys are just different to me. But now looking back, I suppose with a, a sort of the benefit of maturity, they weren't actually doing that intentionally. It's just that they all had, they all knew the ski language, right? So they were comfortable with it and knew what it meant and didn't understand why I, I didn't know what it meant. So that's that's my example of uh, not a feeling not belonging, um, but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily their fault. Now on Values Jam, there's also, as you know, there's an opportunity for us to invent a question. So I'd like to invite you to do just that. And so please ask your own question about belonging beginning with who, what, where, when, why, or how. What was your funniest experience of belonging? Oh, funniest experience of belonging. Well, I, it's for other people to judge whether it's funny or not. I, I think it's probably, for me, it's a bit more amusing. Um, so I've always enjoyed, you call it soccer, we call it football, uh, from a, a very young age. And um, when I was in my late 30s, I got invited to join a veterans team. <laughs> so you had to be, uh, th I think, 35 plus was uh, the, the, the qualification. And um, it was great. We, we had a wonderful time. Uh, people that were probably between 35 and early 40s. And we actually won our regional league. And my kids used to really rip me to pieces because of it, because that was the first time I'd won anything playing football, even though I'd been playing since I was like seven years old. And it took me that many years to win anything. But I, it, it was a really great sense of belonging, probably driven by the fact that we were pretty good. And so it, it was easier than if we hadn't been successful. So I'm not quite sure why that's come to mind, but that's the one. And I don't really think I did answer your question in terms of it being funny, um, but what's yours? Actually, it would be a soccer one as well. I uh, went to university, I got accepted into law school in, three, uh, in four hours and had three weeks to get there. It, that actually happened and my oldest daughter I had told she was a soccer player and I told her I'd always wanted to play but I never had the opportunity coming from a less than privileged background as well getting to on sports teams being able to afford uniforms and play so she got me she got me to purchase a pair of soccer boots and sent me off with a soccer ball to to you know when I went to university and um I think it just gave me the gumption to go and apply. So when I trotted down to the university tryouts as an older student, um, they basically chased me out of there. <laughs> so I trotted off undeterred and joined a ladies team. And we actually came in second in the league that year. Uh, and the first time we played against the university girls, I got put face down in the mud immediately. Believe it or not, my team had placed me as a centre forward. I don't know what they were thinking of. Um, but it reminded me of that movie, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, yeah. um, where, where the lion, you know, played, you know, and they ended, I, that was exactly what happened to me. They all come racing down the centre of the field like a herd. I <laughs> just took the ball. My feet out went, went out from under me and I was face down in the mud. And... Um, and my team stayed there and helped me up. And I think that was, that was like, I couldn't stop laughing and spitting mud everywhere, but that was just a lovely experience of, of belonging and 
feeling terribly bad that we'd seeded a goal. <laughs> but to finish the league at number second was pretty, well, number two was pretty good as well. Oh, that's a great story. And, you know, so you're talking about university. That This has reminded me of another example, which is probably going to put me in a very immature light. So I uh, don't know where this is going to go. Uh, so we had, um, we were living on campus and we had uh, a communal kitchen for the floor of rooms. And I struck up a friendship with four other guys. And so we did stuff like we cooked our dinner together and, you know, that sort of thing to save us doing it separately. But we were also quite playful. And um, so some example, oh dear, thinking back, how childish was this? So there was a guy that wasn't in our friendship group. And um, when he was asleep, we took the bricks from a local construction site and bricked up his door from the outside. <laughs> Uh, which meant he got a shock in the morning when he opened the door to, to, to go out. Um, and what else? We used to take, we used to replace the door. So what you could do is take the door off its hinge, replace it with another one, which meant that when the person tried it with their key, it wouldn't work. And then they were confused. Um, yeah, and I'll finish with one more, uh, which was one of our five. Uh, we knew that he had a new girlfriend. And so... We we removed the springs from beneath his mattress of his bed and then delicately placed the mattress on the frame oh. and then just waited outside his room when he came back from the, the student bar and just waited for the collapsation. <laughs> but, oh, my goodness. Full of mischief. Yeah. So um, no judgments, please. But they, they were funny at the time. So it was your question. <laughs> So let's draw this values jam to a close with the final question, which is, what are you encouraged to do differently about the value of belonging as a result of our conversation today? Mm, I, th I think be more patient and uh, kind while people decondition themselves. Yeah, well, people decondition themselves from from feeling like they do not belong. And t tell me a little bit more about deconditioning. Well, um, I think often people, well, speaking for myself, uh, sometimes I may feel like I don't belong somewhere when in actual fact it's all the chitter chatter in my head that's got me very busy thinking that, making me less accessible and less open to joining the circle. Okay. And if I could just ask you to think about the first opportunity that you're going to have to move in that direction in a very practical, concrete way, when's that going to be? It's going to be in about two hours. <laughs> okay. I have a big meeting with global leaders and... Uh, um, Yes, I'm going to have to decommission, decondition my thinking uh, during that meeting. Yeah. Okay. So um, mine is uh, my partner and her children have just moved into my property. A bit of a long story, but basically uh, where they live is being uh, redeveloped. And so they have to give over their house and everything's knocked down and then they get a new house back in a couple of years time. And um, I have been doing, I've been consciously seeking to make them feel welcomed and have a sense of belonging here because um, for Jasmine, who's 16, it's the only home she's ever known, the one that she's just left. And so for me, uh, I'm going to just have that Sharp, even sharper focus on creating an environment to offer a sense of belonging for them. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, Values Jams are always fascinating. I knew that it was going to be like this with you. And for us to choose a, a card like belonging um, felt really appropriate, actually. So I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. I appreciate you, Alan. Thank you.
Take care.